Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our 2023 Living Earth Festival. Thank you for joining us in the Rasmussen Theater. And before we get started, I would like to start by gratefully acknowledging the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we are now gathering. My name is Hayes Levis, and I work in the Museum Programs and Learning Department. And as part of the this Living Earth celebration, we are joined today by several community leaders in conversation about water and agricultural challenges they face. Our panelists are Reina, Joey, and Lucia. So we'll start with Lucia. I'm sorry, Reina, I did it again, I apologize. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your project you're working on. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Reina Bentia. I am from the Pueblo of Zuni in New Mexico. I have been farming for the past uh, several years. Uh, mostly, I've been working on preserving our heirloom indigenous crops of the Southwest, uh, doing a little bit of modern agriculture and mixing it with our traditional practices um, because we have a lot of knowledge on combating uh, the arid desert of the Southwest. So I've been working uh, mostly trying to get uh, our community back uh, on track with um, having agriculture as part of our uh, livelihoods again. And um, I'm part of the Zuni Youth Enrichment Projects Agriculture Committee. And so we've been doing a lot of work with the, uh, trying to get our youth engaged with our cultural traditions. And then could you tell us a little bit about sort of the tradition of the waffle garden and the Zuni dry gardening? Yeah, the traditional gardening that we have established in English, we say waffle gardens, but in my own language, we call them hikoe, which means like depressions uh, in the ground that we um, make with clay. And we have been using that type of gardening for probably hundreds thousands of years and we have been also planting the, our heirloom seeds in those so we've been trying to revitalize that type of gardening as well in my community. Thank you. Joey, how about you? Aloha mai kako o wao Joey kalanakiro kalahui palupe no kalu o ahu mai au. Aloha everybody, my name is Joey. Um, I am from Kahalu Oahu, and I'm here representing Hawaii and kind of a lot of things that we do. Um, I currently work at Kualoa Ranch, a private nature reserve, as a Hawaiian cultural manager and community engagement um, director and also a manager of the education department at the ranch. So I'm here representing Hawaii to kind of advocate for our waterways and the proper management of our natural resources um, as it particularly relates to some of the work that we do in our education programs. Um, specifically speaking, I, I, I think Hayes is going to ask me this question, so I'm just going to go ahead and answer it. Um, he's probably going to ask us about, you know, taro patches or taro terracing and what is that? Um, we trace back our genealogy back to the taro plant in Hawaii, so the cultural significance of growing taro to us is very important. Um, However, we grow it in a way that requires us to have free flowing access to fresh water. Um, because that fresh water system has been kind of diverted and, and displaced into other communities, um, that kind of dismisses the access of the native people in the areas that we're from, um, kind of disrupting that connection of our Hawaiian cultural identity uh, as the native people of Hawaii. So, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm happy to learn, and, and this is our first time to DC, and I'm glad that we're kind of getting together as Native people and um, standing up for similar causes. So thank you for having me. A lot. Thank you. And your shirt, ha your shirt has a story. Do you want to share it? Yes. Yeah, so if you've ever traveled to Hawaii, you know that every single thing that you see has a story. Um, this shirt, uh, we just talked about it, but basically. It's uh, designed by a really famous local artist, Sig Zane. And this is basically what we plant of the Kalo plant. So this is how we propagate the plant. Um, the part that we primarily eat, you can eat the entire thing, but the one staple food of our people is poi. And poi is made of 
basically cooked taro mashed up with water. And it's a way to kind of stretch that carb. Um, it is the only carb in our diet that our genealogy traces back to. So in order to replant it, you need to remove the corm, you need to remove the leaves at the top, and you go ahead and replant that stock into the terrace that we grow. Uh, those are called lo'i. Yeah. So this is, this is the portion of the taro plant that is the most important to us as far as regenerating the next generation of food for our people. Mahalo. And Lucia, tell Hi. me about yourself and the, some of the work you're doing. And I think most people are probably even not even familiar what a chanapas is. Okay, so my name is Lucia. I come from Mexico City. I was born and raised there. And since a few years ago, I work in a project called Collaboratory Kitchen that works in Xochimilco. Xochimilco is a southern borough from Mexico City that has a cultural identity in itself. And we've been working with people from there from some years in what we call chinampas. And I don't know if you've heard of this word before, but it's really fascinating. These are human-made um, human islands. Uh, some of them are 700 or even 1,000 years old. Is a way of cultivating land that started since the end of Teotihuacan, the Toltecs use it, and also the Mexicas, and sometimes uh, they also know them as Aztecs. Uh, so this is a way of providing a good hydrology and food and also flowers to the city that has been resisting for more than a thousand years and, well, 500 years since the Spaniards came, and now there's like not very good policies around such a magical place. So I am fortunate and enough to be able to work in this beautiful place with people that have, um, yeah, received us and well, I'm happy to share. And I think if I remember correctly that um, the Tanapas were originally, when the Spanish first arrived, when the Aztecs were in what is now known as Mexico City, it was surrounded by the Tanapas. Yeah. Could you talk about kind of what what that might have looked like and how that fed the people there? Um, so Mexico City is built, was built, it's built on a valley, on a basin, that was made of five different lakes. And how do you build a city in a lake, right? And this is a question we still ask every day because the city still gets flooded, there's problems with drainage. I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's a lot of earthquakes and the water is all so, um, so Chinampas was a way to provide food within a lake. You create these islands that are very fertile, that have a really high productivity. So uh, I invite you to learn like what the Spaniards wrote when they saw Tenochtitlan. Imagine getting in the valley, having the volcanoes around you, maybe with snow, and seeing these like chinampas surrounded by willows because they keep the, their roots keep the land together and like the pyramids. I don't know if I ever have the time, the chance to go back in time. <laughs> I'll choose to go there. <laughs> okay, so Reina, I'm gonna give you the first question. What are some of the difficulties that you face? What is the most important thing that you want people who are not familiar with the what gardening that happens with the Zuni, what would you want them to know? I think for my own community, one of the challenges that we've been facing for many decades has been our, our lack of water. Um, this area here in Washington gets a lot of water every year, so we're lucky enough to get more than seven inches of rain where I come from. Um, we've had a river that ran through our community uh, since we've settled there. And over time, it's been changing because of like infrastructure of the dams that have been placed along it. And also more use of the watershed system from uh, upper in the watershed. So a lot of our <clears throat> 
our culture is based on agriculture and without a lot of the water resources that we used to have, it's kind of been a bit more difficult to regain that larger scale production that we had in place that fed our entire communities. So as climate is changing, we've had to rely on other uh, sources. We've always been very good at water conservation uh, because we live in the desert, but we've also uh, been more um, proactive in trying to do more rainwater catchment and rainwater harvesting uh, when we do get those uh, seasonal storms that come. Uh, we have a monsoon season that uh, is supposed to come about June-ish uh, and all the way uh, throughout the summer months. But as climate changes, we've noticed that we've gotten sporadic amounts of rain. Uh, they last um, not as long as they used to and they come later in the season. And when we do get rain, a lot of it sometimes is like, like too much all at once. So our soils aren't um, kind of absorbing it in a, in a way that like it flows down into the aquifers anymore. It's more like the rain hits the ground all at once and because there's nothing uh, holding the soil together, it just kind of washes down. And we've had a lot of impacts on fire with the fire seasons are becoming more intense. Um, so I think also for myself, uh, lack of uh, land to farm on has also been one of the challenges. And uh, I know a lot of uh, farmers in New Mexico and a lot of our indigenous communities, um, the land aspect is also something that we've had to been, we've been fighting for for a long time. Um, and also like, also the water rights part of it, so. And I, I saw your presentation yesterday, and you were talk, you have a lot of the youth that are now getting involved. Do you want to talk about some of the programming you're doing with the youth and how they're going to be carrying on? Yeah, so I mentioned that I'm part of the Zuni, um, Zuni Youth Enrichment Project. That's um, the main kind of program in Zuni that um, tries to do more activities with the youth. Uh, I'm only a committee member. I don't like work directly um, with the kids all the time. Um, but as the program develops, they've been doing a lot of work on getting the youth more involved in their traditional practices, whether it be agriculture. Uh, we have been known to create um, a lot of our our jewelry, which is something I'm wearing right now. We're famous for uh, making turquoise jewelry, pottery, um, let's see, our paintings and drawings, embroidery, uh, all, the, all the types of traditional artwork and clothing and stuff that we are slowly losing. We're trying to get the youth to um, be more involved in that aspect. So. Also, language revitalization, I think, is important in our culture because that's that's how we've carried on our knowledge. So that all those aspects and the process of eating and cooking our own foods, that's something that we're really trying to um, get the youth to be more, um, I guess, well-rounded in our own culture. Thank you, Rena. And Joey. Uh, a lot of communities, I think, are are seeing a, are having a lot of pushback from bureaucratic agencies. So, if you could talk maybe a bit about how those agencies are impacting the work that you do, and also, I was thinking that there's a lot of water diversion that happens to other areas that were not traditionally part of the uh, Avapua'a system. Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> so, basically, in Hawaii, we're faced with, you know, the same story of colonization as many of the native people around the world. Um, however, our history is far more recent than most. So, you know, the Hawaiian kingdom was illegally overthrown in 1893. And from that point um, up until 1970, the culture was entirely erased, right? Um, we had this period of kind of resistance and we call it the Hawaiian Renaissance to the 70s. Um, and that's when, you know, a, 
a large population of the Native Hawaiian people got together and kind of stood up against some of the things that were happening. The main issue at the time in the 70s, in the 70s was the loss of water um, and all of the water being diverted. So that gave them um, kind of a platform to, to stand up and regain uh, management over this natural resource. Um, other issues that might have happened in, in that time that were kind of addressed, you know, 10 years later, were things like stopping the bombing of one of our major Hawaiian islands um, that was used for military testing. So, you know, there's massive issues that we're faced with from the situation that were put in through the U.S. government that um, definitely stops us from engaging in cultural practices. Today, luckily, you know, we're, we're afforded a situation that our ancestors or, or what we call our kupuna, those who came before us, were able to kind of be that front line for us and be that resistance for us so that we can actually institutionalize some of our learnings and expand and begin to build a better uh, future for our kids. Um, a lot of the pushback that we're getting now um, is at the level of natural resource management, but also the coding and uh, the zoning of different land use permits. So we're, we're facing a lot of permit issues where certain agricultural um, zoned areas are now being converted into residential areas um, through rezoning processes. Um, so there's been a lot of, you know, bills that are proposed to the state level and to the, to the U.S. government to try and kind of reverse some of those things and, and kind of prove that Hawaii is a very unique situation where the natural resources that we depend on are really all we have. Um, because we're so isolated, we depend on everyone else outside to kind of feed us. So, you know, we're we're faced in a time where 90% of the, the food in the grocery stores in Hawaii are from outside resources. So we're not self-sustainable at this point um, at all. And we're very far from it. And, you know, the systems that the U.S. has placed on Hawaii took away our ability to be sustainable. So we're trying to get back to a point of being sustainable and the state's realizing that we need to get there. But the U.S. policies that are in place don't allow us to, to really explore that because we're different from the U.S. Like our, our ecosystem is set up differently. Our environment, our natural resources are, are a lot different from things that might apply and make sense here in America. Doesn't necessarily translate very well in Hawaii. Um, so for that reason, there's, there's been a lot of pushback and a lot of education that needs to happen. So that's kind of the game plan where we're at right now is we're just trying to face the community and, and spread this awareness and educate others. So when it does get to the Congress level, they understand, right? If, if we're trying to educate them at the Congress, it's, it's way too late and we're not going to get the results we need in the time we need it. Um, so we're just trying to explore different ways to kind of get that information there and then hopefully have, you know, our kids at the table with the Congress um, as those elected officials. Like that's, that's, you know, the game plan for now. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's been a long road of consistent struggles, but a lot of the struggles are the same struggles we were facing 50 years ago. Um, and it still continues. It's just another layer added onto it or a different challenge, a different part of that process. Um, but we are determined this is very intergenerational trauma and it, that means it'll take many generations to heal. So we're committed to that and just kind of being a part of what our parents have afforded to us. I, I'm going to ask you one more question there. Uh, I believe the traditional system of management was the Avapua'a yes. and the water has a very unique um, place in that. Could you sort of talk through Avapua'a and the terrace? Yeah, there? totally. So I'm going to expound on this a lot uh, in my presentation later this afternoon, but I, you know, just to kind of keep it short, basically our natural resource management system traditionally was a system set up that was called an Ahupua'a system. And an ahupua'a system is a system that runs from the top of the mountain down to the ocean and out into the fringing reef. That was inclusive of all the resources you needed to survive as one singular community. So in America, I think, you know, we look at the native people here as being segregated into different tribes. In Hawaii, we were all kind of one people that lived in pretty close areas, but we were separated by mountain uh, ridges and 
different land natural resources that kind of separated us and the people and the population that resided in each ahupua'a were determined by what that ahupua'a can provide so if there's x amount of resources there x amount of people can live there and and no more than that so there was this this sort of buffer to where the land maintained the amount of people there and i think in the day and age that we live in now we like to say, you know, we live in this free country and we live in this free place and you can kind of live wherever you want and insert yourself into a system that maybe you're not even providing for. So, you know, we're trying to unwind those things and, and get back to that Aupua'a system where if you're living somewhere in Hawaii, you should be contributing to the health and wealth of that place, right? So it starts with understanding the system first and that entire system is built on fresh water. So our ability to farm, our ability to engage in cultural practices, our ability to identify as Hawaiians stems from our resources and stems from our ability to tap into the fresh water um, and complete that cycle. In Hawaii, um, we consider ourselves part of the Ahupua'a system. So different from you know, the Western context of understanding that there's man and then there's land. Uh, in Hawaii, we're one. We're tied to that and we're a part of that cycle and we're so connected in a way that we benefit the land. And, and that's kind of the priority of, of life in Hawaii is anything that we do, anything that we build or implement or different ways of agriculture needs to benefit the land before it benefits us. And if we get any benefit out of that, that is the, you know, the added value that we can take from it. But until the land is healthy, we don't really consider ourselves beneficiaries of it. Thank you. And Lucia, what, could you talk, what, a lot of communities now are facing issues with environmental impacts, uh, man-made incidences like pipes and Tonga with the earthquakes. In Mexico, I think you have issues maybe with earthquakes, and I think you mentioned also issues with water being diverted. Um, so what, what is sort of your plan to be able to deal with, with the disasters and how to keep the Tanapas moving forward? Okay, so where to start? <laughs> it's a big question, I know. <laughs> so just to give a little bit of like historical context, ever since the Spaniards arrived in what was known as Tenochtitlan, there has been efforts to dry out the lakes. And there are still some remnants of the lake, but there's very few areas in the borough of Xochimilco is probably the one that is better conserved. Um, it does have uh, some titles, for like example, for UNESCO or for the Ramsar um, that are protecting uh, swamps. Um, there's other chinampas in the borough of Tlahuac, but from what I know, they're not in a very good state. So this is an ongoing process for 500 years. And I mean, uh, acknowledging that I'm not part of the community, um, I'm, and hopefully, an ally for them. Um, I would say that um, water is the, one of the most uh, spoken about problems within the Chinampas. Um, since the beginning, especially of last century, uh, what happened with the water from the Chinampas is that it used to come from spring water, so it was crystal clear. And uh, this water was intubated and was sent to the <clears throat> richer boroughs of the city so they can have this fresh water. And I recently was able to actually read the report and they did like a very minute study of the beautiful water that was in Xochimilco. They say they had like this steady, clean rate, same temperature, so it was purposely, purposefully done. And it actually happened that Chinampas were dried up and people did this huge riot and protest um, so that they get water. And the city was like, okay, we'll give you sewage water. 
and and they were like, oh, we'll give you uh, some uh, plants to treat the sewage water, but we all have really profound doubts that this is not, uh, these plants are not really working. It's a very delicate issue because it has a conservation status. So questioning the quality of water could put in risk that status. Um, Chinampas, imagine, like, is, a, is an island that was made 700, 500, or even 100 years old. It's, um, it's like a biocultural monument, and now they make, for example, soccer fields, or they're just abandoned, and people that still work in the Chinampas. Um, I wish we could help them get a visa, get a passport, and get a translator, so they come here and they talk themselves of what it is to plant a chinampa, and how much they get paid for their work, uh, it's really sad. And like when we talk about sustainable cities, Mexico City has a population of 8.8 .8 million people, and the whole basin, um, the whole like metropolitan area, 19 million. And chinampas are abandoned. We could have food from there, and it poses like real questions, like similar to what. Joey was saying like food sovereignty in Mexico City is <laughs> is is really low. So we really need to 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 rethink the way we relate to nature, the way the city is supporting its own people, the way the city is looking to to have their own food. Um, the water what are we doing with water? Um, so Another question for you. Let me. I grew up. My family. We always had a small garden in the back, and we got basically one set of crops a year. I understand with the chinampas that there's a greater yield, and because of the relationship with the water, there's also protein sources that are sort of underneath the uh, chinampa area. Could you tell us a bit more about that? So, chinampas are great. Like. <laughs> They're really fascinating because in their system, uh, they are surrounded by channels. And the way you maintain the chinampa is uh, through dragging mud from the bottom of the lake. We're talking about shallow lakes. And that mud is put on the chinampa like a big mud cake um, that is called almacigo. And then that mud cake is separated into smaller pieces like bite size. And you, you plant on them, and the fact that you're dragging things from the bottom of the lake will give you a lot of like um, organic matter. It will give you a lot of minerals that when you take them out, they get oxygenated, so they're even better. So some people ha in the same plot of land can have two, three, even five different cycles a year, which in, in Mexico City, we have... Um, a dry, uh, um, in that area of Mexico, we have like a dry and a rainy season. It's two seasons a year. So usually uh, in other areas, we only have one season of cropping a year. So the fact that in Chinampas we have way more, it's um, a great opportunity. All right. Thank you. So now I'm gonna pose one question and have each of you answer it. So in recent years, we hear a lot of conversations about what we can do to save our planet. What advice would you give people who want to help? As a call to action, what is something that people could do? So, Raina, we'll start with you. So, <clears throat> one of the main things that I've come across in my agriculture journey is that my appreciation for the foods that I grow is that connection to the plants uh, that we caretake and that we have been caretaking for all these years. The importance of growing traditional crops that are from your ancestry, I think is one of the things that I feel like the most strongly about. Um, we all have different traditions and cultures that we uh, have in our lineages 
So the importance of finding like your own ancestral plants uh, and diets, I think, is one of the things that you'll have that stronger connection to the places that your um, ancestors were from. And I think that appreciation for the things that we've kind of forgotten about is something that will kind of help amplify our awareness of the things that we might be losing and have lost. So I think just becoming uh, more aware of our ancestral foods. Thank you. Joey? Um, this is a massive question. I think there's so much that we can do. Um, you know, I, I think as it applies to Hawaii, the most important thing, you know, that we're facing right now is trying to retrain our tourism industry to attract responsible individuals to Hawaii. Um, that's one of the most visited places, I think, in the U.S. Um, and it's also the smallest. You know, we've, we've gotten to a point where we have 15 million visitors a year and there's only 1 million people that live there. So majority of our resources are ending up hosting others that are not giving back to our system. Um, basically what I'm urging, you know, those who come to Hawaii to do is be a part of the system that is benefiting the entire system. There's so much you can learn in Hawaii. Um, the growth rate of, of majority of our plants is 20 times faster than anywhere in the world just because of our geological location and the isolation of our land masses. Um, there's so much to learn in such a quick visit. And if you can take whatever you learn from Hawaii back to where you're from, and maybe it's just a deeper connection to a place, uh, that would be awesome. You know, there, there's so much potential for Hawaii to be um, this shining star in, in this large world where we're just a speckle, um, but there's a lot of answers there. I think that most visitors don't get the opportunity to experience, you know, you get stuck in the tourist trap of going to the fancy luau or, you know, hula skirts and, and whatever you think of when the fantasy of a, of a, you know, paradise pops up on your, your Google search for what to do in Hawaii. Um, I would encourage you to step out of that box and, and just feel the place, um, get to know some of the local communities, offer help, you know, see if there's a way that you can help in that process. Um, we're maxing out capacity every day on the island that I live on. It's 30,000 visitors every day visiting our place. Um, and that number is increasing. That's currently, that's a, about the average of the visitor income right now. Um, but Japan still hasn't opened and that's normally our, our biggest driver in the tourism industry. Um, so we're expecting it to double in the next six months and up to 60,000 people per day on an island that only has, you know, 900,000 people on it. So, you know, I, I, the situation that we're stuck in is definitely correlated to the amount of people that visit the place. Um, most people will come to Hawaii and you're never going to visit Hawaii and not want to live there because it's so beautiful. Right, that's a given, um, but please do consider what that might, you know, end up doing. And sorry for getting a little choked up, but it uh, it ends up displacing a lot of our Hawaiians. So just you know, take those things into consideration. The numbers are unbelievable. We had 115,000 Native Hawaiians move away from home last year. Uh, that's 10% of the total population. And we're at a point where there's more Hawaiians outside of Hawaii than there are in Hawaii. And that fight isn't gonna end unless we get the general consensus to understand what's really happening. So yeah, if there's any urge of that, it's just learn from how we travel and we can all pitch in and kind of be better to these larger global issues because I'm sure Hawaii is not the only place experiencing these things. Thank you, Joey. And then Lucia, again, so the question is, what advice would you give people who want to help 
And as a call to action, is there something you think that people could or should do? Um, so I think that especially people like me that do not believe belong to an indigenous community. And for example, I was raised in uh, an urban context within Mexico City. Um, I think the first step is really to reevaluate our relationship to, to nature, to food, similar to what, to what Reina was sharing with us. Um, and I, that will have like a lot of impact in the decisions in, for example, when you become a tourist, what type of tourist would you like to choose? Um, of course, in Xochimilco, it's not the same as the extent as is in Hawaii, but tourism is also a big problem. People go only to the Chinampas to get like really, really drunk and there's no support for, for the cropping system or for the traditional flower plantations. Um, and I think also uh, in a professional level, we can also find ways in which we can make positive impacts to, to, to the communities that we care for. Um, as a doctor or I, as a biologist or in your daily movements, um, but I think we really need to reevaluate our relationship to our land and how we want this land to be in the future and start acting accordingly. All right. So that sort of concludes the panel part. If there's anybody who would like to ask any questions, there's a microphone back up there. Please step up to the microphone. Uh, Jay, hold your hand up and ask any questions from there. And if you want a particular person to answer it, please direct the, the question to that person. Hi, uh, I mean, I guess this is a question for the three of, uh, of the panelists, uh, uh, especially the ones who were speaking about traveling more consciously. Um, how can tourists start actually planning a trip, having these things in mind? Usually you plan a trip and then you find like a nice hotel and then you find like tourist attractions and that's it. How can you start actually getting involved with the communities when you're doing the planning? Sorry, um, if I understand the question, you're asking if someone, how to be a responsible tourist when we're visiting one of these areas. Is that a reasonable summary of your question? And how can they do it? You know, when they how travel they to Mexico it? and they want to do more than just drinking, when they travel to Hawaii and they, they, want, they want to do more than just going to the fancy luau. You know, how can we actually start getting involved? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Hawaii has a couple organizations that kind of manage the tourism industry and set policies and boundaries around what every tourist organization or company has to commit to. Um, on the state level, that Hawaii Tourism Authority has placed um, these regulations and commitments to our industry that if you are a tourist company or a tourist attraction or whatever it might be, if you're in that industry, you need to be a part of what we're calling the Malama Hawaii program. Um, in English, that means to take care of Hawaii. And basically you've got to have some type of give back program in, in place. Um, so there, there are new opportunities. They're, they're not the most attractive right now just because they're new. Um, I think Experiencing those things, really having an appreciation for it and an understanding of it, but also dropping a great review and boosting about it and totally blowing it up on social media. Those are great things, I think, that'll help us to push this drive. Um, I work in the number one tourist attraction on Oahu, and, you know, we, we get a crazy amount of tourists coming for things like zip lining and riding ATVs and seeing the set of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, and a sliver of those people come to actually take care of the place. We, we have those experiences available, but it's not yet the popular option because it's not taken fruition yet, right? It's, it's still a new concept, and it actually developed during the pandemic, during COVID, when you know we were worried about resources coming in on the barge and there were some weeks that the resources didn't come and there were no food there was no food in the grocery store like you go to the store and there's literally nothing there um 
and the the private you know industries or different agricultural farms, nonprofit organizations, were the ones that really picked up that weight and carried that responsibility to feed the community. And we were able to just give free food to our community to supplement whatever wasn't coming in on the boat. Um, that wouldn't have happened if we had those 15 million people there that year to take that free food away from the local community. So what we're really asking for is like, hey guys, come. We, we're trying to do this. We're trying to make it work. But the visitor needs to buy in. Otherwise, there's, there's definitely no gain. So there are programs there. You know, at, at every tourist attraction in Hawaii, just ask them, like, hey, what are you guys doing for Malama Hawaii program? And if they can't provide an answer, then that's, that should actually be reported. But, you know, there, there are many places that you can go to to experience these things, um, specifically in Hawaii right now. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? It's hard to see you. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings be you. We are celebrating the festival of Eid, and I'm here with my eight-year-old niece, who is very interested in saving Earth, as she calls it. So she told me to ask this question to you. So this is for the whole panel. What can she do as an eight-year-old to preserve water and to save Earth? about the water and really appreciate the water, love the water, love, appreciate what you're eating and you will understand ways in which in your house you can start taking care of it, start growing your food, um, lots of reading, visiting, learning about the land that you live. I, I would definitely encourage you know, if you live in a very, I guess, um, urban setting, it can be really hard to find that connection to water because you don't see it, right? Um, one thing that is very different from how I grew up in Hawaii is we, we got to see and play in water every day in streams. And when those streams are dry, you, you ask the question, what's going on? Um, there were times when I was, you know, your age and I'm hiking up in the mountain to the place that I normally would swim at and there's no water, but there's a pipe. So I broke the pipe. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's that sense of dependency on a resource, but until you really create that realistic relationship with it, if you're still turning on the sink to get water and showering in the, in the shower, and you have a tap and you have access to it, you're really not connected to that water. So maybe, maybe ask yourself, where does this water come from? And, and find that. Um, they, there's a saying in Hawaii, the, the Hawaiian word for water is vai. It can also be pronounced wai. And we always ask our children, do you know your why? And do you know your reason? Do you know your resource? Do you know who you are um, and your water and where it comes from? Keep going, find the water. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, I think when we think about water, it's that like that tangible thing we see. But I think spiritually, that water is inside of us. It makes a majority of our, our human body is made up of water. And when um, the rains came yesterday, the water is in the sky, the water is in the clouds. And when it was raining yesterday, uh, we always say that our ancestors come as rain and water. And so that spiritual connection we find all in nature is what uh, gives us that um, drive to protect um, what's important to us. Um, and I think when it comes down to how we get our youth involved is to uh, really be um, mindful of the, our own practices as adults because we're, we're the ones that our young ones are looking towards and following 
and learning from. Um, and I think it's uh, really heartwarming to see our young people um, know that some things aren't uh, right. They have that intuitive sense that um, makes them aware of things that uh, we don't normally see as we grow older. Uh, so really cultivating um, their appreciation for um, nature and for the resources that we have available. And even um, getting their own friends involved. I think when you think you're doing it all alone, it feels really daunting. But when you get other people involved, when you get your whole community involved, it, it makes you feel like you can accomplish more than you can as an individual. And I, I just want to add to you know this, this idea of being connected on a spiritual level to your resources. Um, that's an indigenous thought that's very universal. And in today's world, it seems very foreign and hard to attain. Um, but, you know, it, it does exist. So I, I do highly, you know, encourage everyone to, to try and find that, whatever that means to you, um, however you can tap in, because I think as soon as you create that connection and you can, you know, continue to foster that relationship with nature, nature responds in a way that you end up being a reflection of it. And, and that place that you're from is also a reflection of you. Um, so much so that, you know, we, we were sitting down, yes, was it, yes, no, day before yesterday, and we are having lunch together, and we are talking about the water, and we are talking about, you know, we, we haven't seen enough water um, as compared to previous years and what we're used to and what our ecosystems need to thrive. Um, just for a quick example, so last year, 2021, well, sorry, year before last, in 2021, we had a, only three inches of rain in Hawaii from January to September. And normally, by that time, we would have had 14 inches. Um, and then from, you know, October to November, we had a solid, like, 20 inches. You know, and and that's, that's not healthy for a system. Systems need stability. Systems need... Um, this, this time period to, to grow and to continue to be stable, yeah, to build that foundation of that ecosystem. But anyway, as we're talking about this, you know, we're, we're, there's a lot of connections that we're making about water and um, these parallel thoughts are flying in the air and I get a text from home and my house is flooding. Like, and it, it, it's just this like, this, intui this intuition that you end up having and you know your place becomes you and you become your place and and wherever you are that that connection can't be disrupted that connection can't be lost because you become it right and and a lot of that is consuming things from that place but also feeding that place so just as much as you're consuming you're giving and and that connection there is that's how it's really maintained so when we talk about food sovereignty, when we talk about drinking water, we talk about opening rivers back, those are the things we need to do, right? To get that sense of place, to, to regain that connection. Otherwise, we're just talking about it, right? It's just this imaginary thought. It's something that we're longing for, but we'll never get because we're really not products of our environment anymore, right? So we, we should be, we should be that. Okay, all right, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much. And if you want a chance. Yes, thank you. Raina did a pre presentation yesterday for the Zuni Gardens, and Lucia and Diego are up next. I'm sorry, you get a very short breathing time. And she'll be talking about the Chinapas, and then we'll finish out the day with more on the Hawaiian terracing and uh, fish ponds. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>